Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to Palm Sunday worship here at First United Methodist Church. I welcome those of you who are here in person and those who are joining us at, online, at home, wherever you may be. So today is Palm Sunday. Uh, it marks the beginning of Holy Week, and it is the day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, and we join the crowd so long ago proclaiming, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, will you stand as we hear our Palm Sunday reading? When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Palm Sunday is a time of great celebration and praise. Have you all experienced that a little bit this morning? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Jesus enters Jerusalem to the cheering and the accolades of an adoring crowd. Uh, and they acknowledge him as Lord and King, and they cry out, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And again, it's, it's a wonderful and celebratory time. Uh, but in a matter of days, that same adoring crowd uh, would change their cries and change their chants from blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify, crucify him. And it really leaves us with an unavoidable question. It's a question that's haunted me. Why the change? What happened? Uh, and even more importantly, what does this change, what does this shift that takes place reveal about us? What does it reveal about me? Uh, when I find myself in a similar situation. And what is that situation? What am I willing to risk for my ideals? What am I willing to risk for my ideals? So there are a variety of explanations uh, about why the crowd changed during Holy Week. Uh, some suggest that the people were looking for a military leader, so they were being ruled by the Romans, and they were looking for a leader to come who would rally the people and who would fight back against the Romans and restore their independence and their dignity. Uh, and then when Jesus came into Jerusalem, that's what they were expecting, but then he came in on a donkey, which is a sign of peace instead of a war horse. And when they realized, oh, Jesus isn't going to fight the Romans, they kind of washed their hands of him and moved on. Some people offer that. Others suggest that the problem was that Jesus set too high a moral bar, uh, that the uh, loving and compassionate Jesus we see throughout the Gospels, the closer he got to Jerusalem, that the more stern and demanding that he became. And when people began to realize that Jesus wanted holiness from them, uh, they, they turned on him. They, they weren't going to do it. And, and the idea here is sort of that they chose their sin over salvation. You all ever heard that one? Kind of, kind of that idea. So uh, I want to ask you, what do you think happened? Why do you think the crowd changed? Why did they go from cheers to jeers in just a matter of days? What do you think? Uh, and this is the benefit of being the preacher. I want to share with you what I think. And, and uh, 
<laughs> and this is uh, something that really has come to me through the years as I've read this story and has made this story more and more meaningful to me uh, and, again, really forces me to ask some hard questions about myself and the way that I live my life. So uh, one of the things that we need to really understand is that the common people really did love Jesus. So when you read through the Gospels, you'll see this over and over again, that as Jesus went out from town to town and he, and he preached and he healed people and he proclaimed God's love and he proclaimed God's forgiveness, the people loved him and they started following him everywhere that he went. Uh, we read story after story in the New Testament about how Jesus even tries to get away from the crowd. He just needs a little bit of a break, but they adore him so much that they, that he, that they, they come and they find him every, every time he sneaks away. And I think that they love him for some really good reasons. Uh, Jesus taught them. He helped them to understand God and God's kingdom. He forgave them. He healed them. He fed them. Uh, he stood up for them against what I call some the religious bullies of the day. Uh, the bottom line is Jesus loved them, and they loved him in return. Uh, and, and Jesus didn't just do these kinds of things for the people. Uh, I think this is also a part of the story. He actually called them and taught them to do the same for others. So Jesus was a man of compassion, and he taught people to be compassionate with one another. Jesus was a man of mercy, and he taught them to be merciful with one another. He taught them to heal each other and to take care of each other and to be generous with each other. And I got to tell you that I think the kind of people that they became when Jesus was around, they liked to themselves, that when they saw Jesus, they were like, oh, this is what people are supposed to be like. This is wonderful. Let's do more of this. Uh, and again, so they, they adored him. And we, and we see that his popularity kind of reaches a fevered pitch in this time when he enters Jerusalem. Uh, he's so popular that he basically descends his disciples and goes, hey, go ask that guy over there for his donkey. And the guy goes, of course, you can have my donkey, you know. Uh, it would, it would be like a, a saying, Keith, can I borrow your car? And Keith just hands, gets the keys and goes, here you go, Jesus, take the keys. Uh, they loved Jesus so much that when he entered town, they put their clothing on the ground for him, and they, and they cut down branches, and it's kind of like rolling out the red carpet, right? Like, this guy is really special. This guy is really somebody. And they gave this, this great cry from the prophets, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They saw him as God's anointed Messiah, right? They, you, you get the picture? They loved him. They loved him, right? But then uh, it goes back and it, and it begs this question, right? But then what happened? But I just want to make sure you really, they, I really do believe that they were sincere and genuine in their love for Jesus and for his me message and for his way. You with me? We got to know that. But what happened? Uh, so for me, we find the answer to this question in one of the most famous stories of Holy Week. And it's the story of Peter's denial of Jesus. And in case you don't know this story, I'll tell it real quickly. So after Jesus is arrested, his disciples scatter, okay? So there were actually temple police who came and arrested Jesus. They took him away, and they took him to hold him in a place where he was going to be tried. So the disciples scatter. Peter follows behind, you know, so Peter sees Jesus, and, and he's kind of, you can kind of picture him like sneaking around with the crowds. And, uh, and this is what Matthew tells us in chapter 26. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, other bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are also one of them. Your accent betrays you. Apparently Galileans had an identifiable accent. Uh, then Peter began to curse, and he swore another oath. I do not know the man. And at that moment, the cock crowed three times, and Peter remembered that Jesus had predicted this moment. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went from that place and he wept bitterly. So let me ask you a question. Did Peter deny Jesus because he suddenly stopped loving Jesus? What do you think? No, okay, I'm seeing some no's. Uh, did Peter deny Jesus because he suddenly didn't believe in Jesus or his message? What do you think? 
Uh, Did Peter deny Jesus because he suddenly decided to choose his sin over salvation? Is that what's happening here? Why did Peter deny Jesus? You all know the answer. He was afraid. He was afraid. And that drive to self-preservation kicked in. That drive to self-preservation. And, and we see this tendency again and again in human history. It's kind of one of our, our darker things about being human. So uh, Ethan and I uh, were watching uh, Masters of the Air. Have you all seen that? It's, it's the new World War II biopic uh, that, that kind of does the Air Force version of it. You've got Band of Brothers, which was the Army. Uh, uh, what's the next one? The Pacific, which was, I think, the Marines, and now they're, doing the, now they're doing the Air Force one. But we've been watching that, but they've only been releasing one episode a week, and so we found ourselves a little impatient, and we wanted more, so we went back and we started watching Band of Brothers all over again. I mean, how many of you have seen Band of Brothers? Again, so uh, not for little kids, um, but it's a great World War II Great World War II biopic, and uh, it follows the 101st Airborne uh, in their... Uh, uh, combat in in Germany and their attempt to liberate Germany and the other countries that had been uh, taken by the Nazis. But in one episode that's called Why We Fight, uh, I found found something that really just hit me hard. So uh, they have taken a small German village where it's interesting, in this German village, it seems like all the Germans are just kind of living, living their lives. You know, they're, they're, there's a baker in the story, and there's just people who are just kind of living their lives. Uh, but these soldiers, these U.S. soldiers, begin to patrol the area around this small town and village, and they come across, for the first time, a concentration camp. And of course, they're horrified by what they see. Now, the German soldiers have already fled, uh, but they've left these prisoners there. Uh, And I won't describe it for you. I'll let you all use your own imaginations, all the horrors you would expect of a concentration camp. And the U.S. soldiers are just like, they're they're shocked by this. And so they do what people would do, right? They run back to the village and they start to get supplies. They start to get food. They start to get water and bring it back to the concentration camp for these people. But when they go into the village, they walk into a a bakery and there's this German guy who's just kind of doing, he's got his his, uh, white apron on and he's covered in flour and, and they start to grab the bread out of his bakery and he starts to protest. And the soldiers get a little angry at his protesting because they're going to go feed these people who are starving to death over here. Right? What are you, how can you protest? And they say basically to the guy, it's a little more colorful than this. They say to the guy, you can't tell me you didn't know what was going on. It's right outside your village. And the baker basically says, oh, I didn't know. And the soldiers say, you didn't know because you chose not to know. Right? Uh, if you look throughout human history, you'll see times and time and time again where people have allowed horrible evils to happen. Why? Because they were afraid. And they were, they, were, they were more interested in preserving themselves, preserving their lives, preserving their families, preserving their little, little world than they were in caring about the people around them who were suffering and in a terrible condition. Uh, We don't have to go back to 1940s in Germany to find that. If you look right here in our own country, during the time of segregation, you see that people were treated in terribly unjust ways. And there were some people who stood up and said, hey, this is wrong. But what did the vast majority of Americans do? They were silent or they were complicit. Why? Because they're terrible, horrible, awful people. Why? Because they were afraid And that drive to self-preservation is what kicks in. And I'm telling you, that's what happens with this crowd during Holy Week. They loved Jesus. They loved what he stood for. They loved the vision that he gave them of themselves and the world. They loved it. But when he got turned over to the Romans and they saw those swords and they saw those spears, and by the way, they knew what the Romans did to people who stood up to them. What did they do? And so their fears kicked in, their drive to self-preserve kicked in, and they, to use a modern term, threw Jesus under the bus. You with me? You with me? Now, that's this darker side of humanity that we see over and over and over again. And I want to ask you this question. Can you think of a time that you were silent 
in the face of some harm or some wrong that was being done, or maybe you were even complicit in the harm or the wrong that was being done. And I will confess to you, I can. I can think of times. I think of times when I was a child when I joined in cruel, cruelty towards another kid. You know, sometimes people were cruel to me. And when I was one of the gang, I didn't want to be, so we'll, we'll pick on that guy instead. Right? Uh, I can think of times as an adult where out of fear for myself, fear for my reputation, fear for my job, fear for my paycheck, fear for my family, I've kept my mouth shut in situations that I knew things were wrong. Uh, you, got, you with me? And, and again, when we start to look at this story through that lens, oh, I start to see myself. I start to see myself. And now the story becomes much more powerful, right? Okay, but here's the good news. There are also stories throughout history of people who didn't give in to their fear and didn't give in to that sort of immediate self-protective side. One of my favorite stories is a guy, about a guy named Casper Ten Boom. Some of you know, you know the name Corey Ten Boom? Corey was a great Christian writer, again, coming out of that World War II era who went around Germany and talked about forgiveness and mercy. She's a great, great follower of Christ. Her father's name was Casper. You wonder, where did she learn all this from? Her father's name was Casper. Casper. And during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, Casper and his daughters became active in sheltering and protecting Jewish people from the Nazis. So when the time came in the Netherlands when the Nazis made the Jewish start to, start to wear those yellow stars, Casper Ten Boom, a Christian man who didn't have to do it, said, I'll wear a star too, and went around his community, again, standing up for the Jewish people who were being persecuted in his midst. And eventually they began to hide Jewish people in their home. They were caught by the Nazis for that, uh, and they were sent to a concentration camp. But when he was arrested and he was being uh, interviewed by the Gestapo, uh, one of the young Gestapo officers saw Casper. He was 84 years old and said, hey, old man, you remind me of my grandfather. If you promise me that you'll stop hiding Jewish people, I'll let you go. So if you promise me, when I, I'm going to let you go, that you'll stop hiding Jewish people, then you can have your freedom. And this is what Casper Ten Boom said. If I go home today, tomorrow I will open my door to anyone who knocks for help. Uh, he died in prison in a concentration camp 10 days later. After that, he had a chance to go free, but he didn't give in to his fear. He didn't give in to his self-preservation. Instead, he said, I'm going to stand up for what's right, and I'm going to take a risk for love, really. So uh, I think, again, we can look at the civil rights movement in our country, and we see people, again, who are willing to stand up and risk themselves for what's right. We think about people like Martin Luther King Jr., people like Rosa Parks, but I want you to know, if you don't know, you don't have to go very far to find one of those people. Just next door at Mount Zion Baptist, the, the pastor there for years was a man named T.J. Jemison. It's, he's named, this road out here is named after him. And he was one of the first people in our country who began to stand up about uh, segregation on buses. And he started one of the first bus boycotts and said to people, enough! And I promise you that he was taking risks when he did that. But why did he do it? For love. For love of, you know, by the way, we're supposed to love our neighbors as what? Ourselves. Right? When we look at the story of Holy Week, it becomes clearer and clearer to me uh, and I would encourage you to look for this as we journey through these events this week. There is only one person in this story who is not driven by fear and self-preservation. Got any guesses? I mean, if you look at the story, the religious leaders are afraid. I even think Herod is afraid. I think Pilate is afraid. I think the soldiers who arrest Jesus are afraid. I think the crowd is afraid. I think the disciples are afraid. There's one person who's not, and I already heard you say it, Jesus. Jesus is the one person who is not intimidated by threats and violence. He's the one person uh, who loves others enough to risk himself. He's the one person who trusts that if he lives for love, God will deliver him. And if God won't deliver him in this life, Jesus has so much faith, he says, then God will deliver me in the next life, beyond this life. And by the way, he was right. Still with me? So it's the story of contrasts. 
There's the crowd and their failure of nerve. And then there's Jesus who shows this incredible courage and faith. And of course, here's the question for you and me. Who are we in the story? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Uh, Do you want to be the the crowd or do you want to be Casper Ten Boom? I want to be like that old man. He amazes me. Do you want to be like the crowd or you want to be like Jesus? Which one? What injustices are happening in our world today that we are silent about or that we're complicit about because we're afraid and we, we have this thing, I want to preserve and protect myself. And, and listen, I'm not talking about being a moral busybody. We have enough of those. I'm talking about being like Jesus, not shrinking back in fear, but standing up for and risking ourselves in love. That's what I'm talking about. What people around us are being forgotten, abused, stepped on, because we are too concerned about ourselves and not concerned enough about our neighbors. Uh, There was a man who uh, visited Baton Rouge several weeks ago, Dr. James O'Connell, and he's a doctor from Boston who spends his life caring for homeless people. And uh, and he said something very interesting. So if you want to know, okay, Brady, how how do we figure out who, where where are these injustices? Where are the people who are being stepped on? Where are the people who are being forgotten? Uh, You know one of the best places we can look to begin to uncover some of that? Look at the most vulnerable. Look at the ones who are being stepped on. Look at, again, the ones who are being forgotten. So he says this, homelessness is a prison, prism, sorry, it's probably also a prison, it's a prism held up to society that refracts the weaknesses in our health care, housing, welfare, education, legal, and correctional systems. If you want to see where people are being forgotten and stepped on, look at the most vulnerable. And, And here's the question I find myself asking more and more, do we care? Do we care? Uh, There's a statement that's attributed to a guy named Edmund Burke. Some of you will know the statement. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, you know the rest of it? To do nothing. To do nothing. So listen, I don't believe that the people of Jesus' day turned on him because they rejected what he stood for. I think they loved him and they loved what he stood for. Do you? I do too. Uh, They loved Jesus, and they meant their hosannas that day. I really think they did. But when push came to shove and it was actually going to cost them something, they chickened out. What about you and what about me? Are our praises and hosannas temporary? Are they passing? Or do we mean it even if it costs us something? In a world that needs more love and more care and more compassion and more empathy and more generosity, who are we going to be? Who do we want to be? Are we going to be the crowd or are we going to be Jesus? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.